Previously on Bleach. I don't know what's gonna be on the other side of the gate, guys, but for right now, this will be Tekken 101 signing out! Ugh. to it. <laughs> hey everybody, how are you doing? Teching and Barry here with a new Bleach chapter review. Did I die? Am I in the Soul Society right now or something because, or maybe in a coma or something because, yeah, I never thought I was ever going to say those words again, ever. Like, the anime's coming out next year, so I was preparing for that, but this came out of left field. By the way, here's an anniversary 20th, uh, you know, year special for Bleach. Um, here's a 73-page manga chapter drawn by Kubo. Here it is. Um, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that is established here today. Uh, whole new concepts, uh, delve into a realm that we've never really done before in Bleach outside of one of the movies, um, you know, and so I, I don't know anything beyond, you know, what we know as like a group, as like a fandom or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know if there's going to be another one of these chapters like next month or if it's like once a year or twice a year or just whenever Kubo has the time. I, I don't know how this is going to work, um, but a lot of stuff is established. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of metaphor. There's a whole laundry list of things to my left that I'm going to have to discuss here. Probably still going to miss some things, but let me just say, it's good to be back. Um, still in the same room wearing the same suit with, you know, a backdrop, but y you know, you know what I mean? Like, this is where it started. This is where it all began, right? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, thanks to everybody. I mean, if you're just watching this, if you've been watching my One Piece reviews and you see me doing this, uh, that's fine. Or if you've been here since the Bleach days and you're just, you know, ha happy to see it back. Or if you haven't watched me since the Bleach days, like after Bleach ended, you're just like, alright, unsubscribe from teching, and then five years later, here we are. Um, regardless of how you arrived here, I just wanted to say welcome and thanks to everybody for your support. Um, let's, let's dive into this right let's dive oh that's right it's a bleach review we're gonna have cameos no uh is this a bad time or should i come back later ah uh, hey man what's going on oh i've been good you know i'm just hanging out you know being law teching and all that um you know getting a lot of fan mail by the way a lot of people really like the law hat you know um Anyway, I see you're doing a manga review. I mean, do you want me to hop in? I could do a bit for a little while. Well, I mean, it's a Bleach review. I honestly don't even know why I made you law teching with the Bleach review. It really didn't make any sense from day one. Well, no, not really, but <laughs> when have you ever made sense? Right, yeah, so uh, how's Law Week going? You're, you're still doing that, right? <sighs> Freaking Law Week, Law Week. Everybody's always talking about Law Week. Just because I'm law teching doesn't mean I always have to be about law. I have a personality. Okay, well, have a good one. All right then. So, to the chapter. Bleach chapter. Okay, there is no number, but I'll be honest with you. It's Bleach chapter 687. Here's Bleach chapter 687 review titled, No Breaths from Hell. Breaths from hell. Breaths. No breaths from hell. Which, are there breaths in hell? I don't know. Well, Unohana, I'm just saying. By the way, that's a massive spoiler. Wait, 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 wait. If anybody out there has not read this chapter yet because you were waiting for me to, you'd be like, wait a second, are you implying Unohana is in hell? 
No, I'm not implying that. No, I'm pretty damn certain of that, actually. So, uh, yeah, we'll get into the chapter. Um, so, first we got the cover spread, though, uh, for Shonen Jump. It's really epic. It's Ichigo and all of the captains, the current captains of the Gote 13. So, the captains that are, you know, in the epilogue of Bleach. That's what I mean by chapter 687. This does not feel like some separate thing from the canon or some... I mean, it is a celebration, of course, but it's not like, you know, here's Ichigo having a self-contained adventure adventure with his friends that barely references stuff from the actual story. Or, you know what else I thought it was going to be? And there's actually something in this chapter that implies this might happen later. Uh, because Burn the Witch, you know, Kubo came out with Burn the Witch uh, last year, that four-chapter little mini-series, and also there was the movie, the OVA. A lot of people were thinking maybe this is like a Bleach Burn the Witch crossover, like a little kind of wacky thing where Ichigo travels to England or whatever, and he runs into Noel and Nina, and they fight dragons or something like that, and that might make sense. You know, that's not really anything relating to Bleach and the grand scope. It's just having fun. You know, here's Burn the Witch, here's a Bleach crossover, go with it. But no, no, it's not that. Literally, if you read Bleach chapter 686, Farewell to the Death Berry, the last chapter of Bleach that came out in 2016, five years ago, and you pick up right after it with this, it connects, like, pretty much seamlessly, all right? This is a continuation, all right? So, uh, not much to really add to the cover spread other than it just looks really cool. You got Ichigo there with his original Shikai. We'll get into that. That's on the list. There's a lot of stuff on the list. So, yeah, that's the cover page. Looks pretty epic. Uh, oh, actually, no, wait, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing! That's Get used to me saying that. That's gonna be a lot of stuff we have to cover in this chapter. Uh, we see Iba in the cover page with his Zanpakuto in its sealed form, and it looks like a Wakazashi, and I never really recalled Iba having a Wakazashi, so that might be like something we just found out. Uh, we still do not know the name or Shikai, or I guess Bankai now of Iba Zanpakuto, because he is a captain now, he would have a Bankai. I still find that funny that it's been, you know, 600-something chapters, he's a captain, we still don't know anything about his Zanpakuto, pretty much. We know what his Shikai looks like, but beyond that, we know nothing. But anyway, yeah, moving on to the new Bleach chapter. So the chapter starts off with a voiceover by an unknown individual as we see a uh, pond or maybe like just a fishbowl that's filled with water and two goldfish. And the goldfish are just kind of swimming around in a circle. So, uh, yeah, all right, Phil, you can just drop off the truck of symbolism right now. We're going to need it for the rest of the chapter. Bring it on, back it up. You're good, you're good. All right. So the, uh, the voiceover goes on to say about the goldfish, like, one time I had two goldfish. They were really adorable. I love them. It's like, yeah, I know. I, I'm already feeling you, mysterious voiceover person. I once had a beta fish named Zeta. He was Zeta the beta, and he was best fish of 2016. Then he died in 2017. I dedicate this Bleach chapter review to you, Zeta. You were the best fish ever, man. Anyway, the uh, voice goes on to say that eventually the larger goldfish died, and that made the smaller fish sad at first, and the person was like, oh, there's only one goldfish in there now, just the sad little fish, you know, swimming on its all by its lonesome. But then, as it happened, the smaller goldfish began to become larger. Now that the larger one died, I guess that means more food or whatever for it to eat, and there wasn't any competition, so the goldfish began to grow larger. And so the voiceover is just like, hmm, I started to think that maybe it was a good thing that the larger fish died, so that the smaller fish could thrive. Oh, man, there's a lot of stuff to unpack with that. But you know what? I got to put that off on the back burner for right now because we're just starting with the chapter. The symbolism and metaphor of that will become more apparent as we go throughout the chapter. Uh, but as just for right now, I did want to look into if there was any significance with, like, the goldfish particularly, like, they, the, the fact that they were goldfish specifically. I'm not smart enough for that kind of stuff, so I wouldn't know. There would have to be some kind of smart version of me that wears glasses in order to properly explain it to all of you people. I said smart version of wait, me. Wait, oh, there hang we go. on, hang on. I'm here, I'm coming. Oh, oh, did I miss the cameo? Am I here? Are we good? Oh, okay. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Smart teching here. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it's been a quite some time, indeed, indeed. Here to fill all of your uh, technological, scientific explanations that, you know, he doesn't want to research himself. That's why I'm here. Hey, weren't you, like, uh, dark teching? Like, whatever happened with that whole side story? Oh, yeah, that. Oh, well, let me tell you about that. It is a um, complicated story, but uh, I don't want to bore you with the details. It essentially is all boiled down to, like, stuff happening. Hmm. Stuff happened. 
Okay, fair point. Anyway, go on about goldfish. Ah, right, yes, yeah, so goldfish. I mean goldfish in the context of Japanese myth. I think we all know what goldfish actually are, okay? So it's actually very interesting. I did some research into this and discovered a few different avenues that this might actually refer to, okay? So the first thing is I looked at yokai, right? You think of Japan, you think of yokai. So there's actually two different variations of fish, specifically goldfish yokai. Uh, one is called kingo no yure, and it's essentially like a fish demon, and it's like the body of someone that was like a murderer that became a half-fish sort of hybrid. Um, I don't really think this is very applicable right here, so I disregarded that. There's another kind of yokai that's not specifically a goldfish, but sort of just like the Japanese yokai equivalent of the mermaid. Um, but overall, I think what Kubo is really trying to go for here is that the goldfish just represents prosperity and luck. Uh, and I think it's also very likely that the person that is uh, giving the speech at the beginning of this chapter is actually Kazui. Uh, perhaps Kazui when he's a little older, just like how Izuku Midoriya is narrating his life in My Hero Academia. And so the reason why Kazui might be reminiscing about this right now is with the events of this chapter, which might lead into a new arc, it might be very possible that some of the stronger Shinigami captains are all going to die, and Kazui and Ichika and like the younger generation have to take over as the new captains of the Gote 13. So it is, it is very intriguing. What do you think? Okay, that was pretty cool. That was really enlightening. Goldfish stand for goldfish. You were not paying attention to a single word of that, were you? Eh, I was kind of fading in and out. Anyway, you have a good day, man. Oh, it's whatever. It's fine. It's cool. Just, I haven't helped you with like 35 freaking ant facts in the last three months. Every single day. Give me a new ant fact. Give me a new ant fact. I can't use Wikipedia. So now we fade into the actual chapter where we see a phantasmal spirit goldfish just flying or maybe swimming through the skies of Karakura Town late at night. I'm sure that's going to be explained. Um, so now we cut over to Ichigo and Orihime's house also in Karakura Town, all right? Remember, Ichigo and Orihime got married and they had their child, Kazui Kurosaki, okay? And Kazui is in his bedroom sleeping. I don't think this is the Kurosaki Clinic because they met up at the Kurosaki Clinic in the, in the last chapter of Bleach, but I think it was implied that like Yuzu was still living there, and so Ichigo and Orihime, you know, they moved out, and, you know, they have their own house now, or whatever, okay? So Kazui is there sleeping, and Kone is there with him in his room, and then Orihime just kind of pokes her head into the room to make sure that Kazui's fast asleep, and then she's like, oh, good, he's asleep. Oh, Kone-chan, thank you so much for playing with him today. So we see Kone off to the side. So Kone essentially has become, like, the babysitter for Kazui to make sure he doesn't get hurt or anything like that, which is actually kind of nice. You know, Kone, you know, he would always, um, you know, argue with Ichigo and Rukia, like, how, why are you making me do all these things I don't want to do? I want to go off on my own or whatever. I'm tired with being in a stuffed animal. But it's been so long now, we're going to find out later, it's been 12 years. 12 years since the end of Bleach, all right? So remember, it was 10 years after the defeat of Yuha that we had the last chapter in the manga, chapter 686, um, and now it's two years after that, and that's expressly stated. Well, you know, Renji's going to say that in a couple of panels here, okay? And so, you know, it's been well over a decade at this point. I imagine Cone has just gotten used to being in the body of a stuffed animal, you know? It's like, you ever watch the Child's Play movies? At some point, Chucky was just like, you know what? I don't even want to try to become a human again. I'm Chucky. I'm the killer doll. I'm who I am, right? So maybe something similar happened with Cone, with, like, less murderous tendencies than Chucky. But, you know, Cone is not, like, the punching bag anymore. You know, Ichigo would always be like, you know, get out of here, Cone, like, toss him through a wall, and Rukia would do that, too, or whatever. I imagine they treat Cone with a little bit more respect now. He is the king of New York, after all. And, you know, he's just living there with them. He's part of the family, and he's like Kazui's babysitter, just making sure he doesn't get into any accidents or, you know, hurt himself by, you know, fall out the window or something. That is actually a concern that we're going to need to, you know, address in a second here. So yeah, Orihime just kind of sticks her head into Kazui's room, just like, oh, okay, he's asleep. Thank you so much, Kone. And then she shuts the door, and that's the beginning and the end of Orihime's cameo in this chapter. That's right, a cameo. We don't see her for the rest of all of this. Don't worry, though, we get Rukio, which, personally, I think that's better. Anyway, though, I, I should also mention we don't really even get to see Ichigo's friends uh, all that much. Uryu might make a cameo. I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, we do get to see Keigo and Mizuhiro, though, so that's nice. And uh, we don't see Chad at all because, of course, Chad's probably not even in Karakura Town right now. He's out there traveling the world, furthering his boxing career, you know? You can read all about it in Chad's spin-off manga that he got a few years ago, Puno Ste Passion, The Fist of Passion, where he travels the world with his uncle, who's his new boxing coach, and Meninus McAllen, one of the Quincy's that survived the war. 
Yep, okay. But yeah, we don't get to see, I don't even think we get to see Totsuki or anything in this chapter. But anyway, so Kazui is asleep, but then all of a sudden, like, he's, like, sensing the goldfish that's swimming around outside. His eyes just, you know, they spring open, and he's like, oh, gotta go, and he just begins to jump out the window. Kid's, like, six years old at this point. He's like, oh, time to go. And Cone wakes up. He's like, no, no, no. You told your mom that you would fall asleep and you would just stay in your room tonight, right? And you made a promise. And so Kazui's like, yeah, but I also made a promise to go tonight and meet, you know, the person that I meet. And Cone's like, well, which is more important? Kazui's like, the promise I made first. And Cone's like, shit, that's actually a good piece of logic. No, don't jump out the window! And so Kazui jumps out the window, but it's okay because he is a Shinigami, as we learned in the last chapter when he met Ichika, Renji and Ruki, his daughter. You know, he's like, oh, I'm Kazui Kurosaki. I'm kind of a Shinigami too. And just boom, he just turned into a Shinigami with the Shihawk show and a Zanpakuto and everything, the whole set. And so he jumps out of the, uh, the window, turns into a Shinigami, and by the way, he seems to be able to just do that without the aid of, like, a combat pass or Ruki a soul glove or anything. He could just shift between, you know, living matter and reishi, I guess, whenever he so desires. That, that is going to require some explanation later on, okay? I mean, like, given all the powers that Ichigo had, Hollow, Shinigami, Quincy, uh, God, plus you had Orihime with the full bring powers, and, you know, she was also, you know, th that was influenced by the Hogyoku, I believe, so there's all these different factors floating around right now, I'm not really sure, but yeah, Kazui's just able to shift into Shinigami form. And we saw in this chapter, Ichigo still requires the combat pass. He still, because he has it on him, so he still needs that to turn into a Shinigami. Kazui doesn't need any of that. He could just turn into a Shinigami at will. So he jumps out the window, turns into a Shinigami, jumps on the back of the goldfish, Cone jumps on the back of a second goldfish that just appears out of nowhere. So I'm not sure if this is implied to be Kazui's ability, his Zanpak Toe power, or he's able to befriend spiritual animals or beings. Um, we know there's a beast realm, you know, because it's all about Buddhist, you know, cycle of samsara, and, you know, Komamura was a representative of the beast realm. So maybe these are the spirits of fish, like fish spirits or whatever and you know he could just summon them or you know he's friends with them or that's his zonpok toe power i'm not sure but at any rate kazui and cone both jump on the back of these uh giant spiritual goldfish and they sail off into the night of karakura town very reminiscent of like a hayao miyazaki movie at this point you can see the you know the whole scene of the animation of them flying through the sky and like the soundtrack queuing up it, it works it does so anyway the whole reason kazui's leaving is because he goes to see um uh, spirits at night you know all the the plus that are all around Karakura Town, so pretty much like what Ichigo did. Remember, Ichigo could see spirits ever since he was a little kid as well, but he didn't know they were spirits because no one was really around to explain this to him. Well, okay, his dad could have explained it to him and his mom could have also explained it to him, but remember when Ichigo was a little kid and he saw a grand fisher, he, he expressly explains, like, at that point in my life when I was like nine years old, I could not distinguish between the living and the dead. So he knew he could see spirits, but he couldn't really tell the difference. I don't really know. I don't know, maybe Ishin or Masaki did explain to Ichigo, like, okay, Ichigo, here's the situation. You're seeing spirits. It's okay. They're called pluses. If you ever see some monsters, let us know. But it's implied he didn't learn about this terminology until he met Rukia. So, whatever. At any rate, Kazui, though, is super friendly with all the spirits of Karakura Town. So, there's this one dude wearing a Hawaiian shirt and an afro, and uh, he's outside weeping, he's crying, and he has his chain of fate. You know, so he is dead. He is a soul. He is a plus. And so, Kazui apparently has been like hanging out with him every couple of nights, you know, make sure he, he didn't feel lonely. So he's out there crying and he's just like, I didn't know you were going to come tonight. I'm so sad. Wah, wah, wah. So, you know, there's all these probably spirits that he just befriends. I don't know if Ichigo is aware of this. You know, Ichigo is like, well, you know, you could see spirits. They're called pluses. They're fine. You know, they're just souls that haven't been cone sewed yet. They haven't been sent to the soul society yet. I, I at least hope Ichigo and Orihime have explained this concept to Kazui. I understand he's only like, you know, a kindergarten age kid at this point, but like, you know, you should probably explain to him that there are giant monsters that might very well devour him, and considering that they're focused on high spiritual energy, that's kind of an important discussion to have. Like, now, Kazui, it's okay if you want to go out there in Karakura Town at night, and you want to, you know, have a soul Shinigami adventures um, with your Zanpaktos, it is pretty cool that you can fly and everything like that, but just keep in mind, there are giant monsters that do want to kill you. So, if you ever see one of those, just come back home, right? <laughs> you know, maybe Maybe give him a cell phone or something. Just just call me. I'll come and kill it in five seconds. You know, Ichigo or whatever. Oh, boy. Anyway, 
So he says, oh, don't worry, mister, it's okay. I have a special place that I want to show you, okay? So Kone and Kazui and this soul all end up at a place called uh, Taka Como Shrine. And I didn't really know the translation of Taka Como. It's probably written with a different kanji. However, I do know that Taka means hawk in Japanese, and Kamo means duck. So it's literally Hawk Duck Shrine. Definitively, don't care about what the actual kanji say. It's a duck shrine. Okay, so Kazui, he's aware that, you know, you need to, you know, satiate the angry duck spirits in order to have peace and balance in the world. You know, speaking of balance, that's also going to be a very relevant thing in this chapter. The two goldfish swirling, balance, the loss of balance. Uh, that was a popular theme all throughout Bleach, you know, stretching back to the substitute arc with, like, the destruction of the hollows by the Quincy's, and then they they talked about how the souls, you know, they don't just go to the soul society and stay there. There's like a cycle, like in Buddhism, through the different realms, and there's reincarnation and all that stuff. And the disruption of balance is like one of the worst things that could happen. That's the reason the Soul King, the Rayo, exists to maintain that balance as the keystone, as the linchpin, to kind of like just focus on the traffic of souls traveling between the realms. Uh, and that was the whole reason Yuha had to be stopped, because he was attempting to kill the Rayo uh, and then basically mold everything back into its original form, which was like simultaneously life and death, everything and nothing. It was very abstract. It was very metaphysical, but uh, Yuha had to be stopped in order to, you know, uh, stop that, you know, merging of the realms. And that's what he was attempting to do, right? But pay attention to that because that will come back, okay? The hawk duck thing, that was just a bit on my part. Anyway, so they walk up the steps of the shrine. There's the Tori gate at the top, you know, that enters a lot of Japanese shrines. And then Kazui kind of goes like off to the side. They don't go into the actual shrine. They go into the woods off to the side. And there's this little like stone shrine just like a bunch of stones piled up together in the middle of this clearing and cone and this soul we never learn his name by the way um they're just like wow this place is kind of creepy what's going on random stuffed animal companion and he's like oh i don't know you know kazui just drags me wherever and so kazui's like no it's okay this is fine all you got to do is clap three times and then you eyeballs okay uh hi how are you uh, my name's Teking. Uh, you are eyeballs. Can you hear me? I ask because you do not have ears because you are just giant eyeballs. Just moving around in a very rhythmic kind of, you know, picture-esque pattern. I don't know. Anyway, um, Kazui claps three times and giant eyeballs appear around him. Uh, the soul and cone are rightfully freaked out by this because they're like swirling around like, you know, Kotodamas or like Will-O-Wisps or whatever, just like looking at them. And so, you know, they're like, okay. And then Kazui's like, okay, now you bow twice, and then you clap again. And then when he does that, a giant gate to hell opens up. Now, you might wonder, how do you know this is a gate to hell? Well, it's, I, I thought originally it was just a Garganta, because it does resemble the Garganta. It looks like the black void of the Garganta beyond it. However, you do see teeth like teeth around the perimeter of the Garganta as it's opening. Like this is the maw of hell, okay? And later on in the chapter, we see another portal actually that we know is connected to hell that looks exactly the same as this. Also, four of the uh, Jigoku Cho or hell butterflies appear around Kazui when he does this. And then he just like, oh, here we go. And then, you know, Cone and the Plus are like, ah. Uh, we're not going through there, are we? Because I'm not going through there, you know? You know, the spirit is like, I, I heard all about, like, you know, heaven and hell or whatever. I'm pretty sure that's hell. And Kazui's like, oh, don't worry, mister. Everybody's waiting on the other side. Let's go! And so then we just get the title of the chapter, you know, No Breaths from Hell. And uh, then we cut away to another scene in the Soul Society. But, like, holy crap, okay, so, um... Kazui has the ability to open a uh, gate to hell, and he does not seem like he is aware that it is a gate to hell. He rather seems kind of excited by the whole thing. Like, hey guys, check out what I can do! <laughs> like, check it out, isn't that cool? Let's go! And it was like, ah, uh, no, I, I don't think we should go through there. And so also the hell butterflies, the Jigoku Cho, uh, Jigoku meaning hell, in case you knew, in case you didn't know what that was, it back here is like, wait a second, that's the kanji for hell. If you already commented that, congratulations, you get a cookie. Anyway.
I'm gonna pick up that Oreo later and eat it. It is too, it is too delicious to waste. But no, yeah, Shigoku means hell, Cho butterflies. So the hell butterflies that are always acting as the guides to the Shinigami traveling through the Dongai. In order to properly go from the Soul Society through the Dongai into the living world, you need to be accompanied by a hell butterfly. And we never really found out what, like, the relevance beyond that was. Like, why are they called hell butterflies? Where do they come from? How are they, you know, able to guide Shinigami to? Did the Shinigami domesticate them? What's going on with that? Also, what's going on with the giant eyeballs, you know, when he's like clapping. So I'm imagining it is some kind of ritual and just like how there's like spiritually charged places in the world of the living that lead to the soul society. Maybe there's also spiritually charged places that lead to other realms like hell, for instance. And Kazui, maybe because Ichigo never told him about hell. I'm sure Ichigo told him about the soul society, at least at this point, right? You know, because, you know, Kazui has met Ichika and Rukia and Renji. So it's like, oh, these are my friends from the Soul Society. He's like, what's the Soul Society? Oh, it's another realm. I'll take you there someday. You know, so I'm sure Kazui at least knows about that. He might be confused. He might think that this is like the portal to the Soul Society or something and like sending his friends like, just go through that portal. You'll be fine. And the, the pluses that he's helping out around Karakura Town. I'm like, are you sure, kid? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm sure. My dad said there's this place called the Soul Society. It's right through this portal. Go right ahead. He's like, okay. <laughs> and then like, how many souls has Kazui dead? to hell, I ask you. Um, and we don't know any more about that. We don't see the dude with the Hawaiian shirt and the afro anymore. So he might have went to hell. He might have not. I'm not sure. If he did, though, probably the final villain of this arc. All right, so now we cut over to the Soul Society proper three hours earlier, okay? We see Ichika Abarai, who is the daughter of Renji and Rukia, of course, and she is going to Ikaku Madarame's training dojo, okay? So this seems to be... She is very much Renji and Rukia kid. She's very boastful and she thinks like, oh, Ikaku, your master, I shall best you today. You know like the scenes in like a manga where you have like two warriors, two like war veterans that haven't seen each other in a while and they're like, ah, how have you been? It's been 20 years since we've last fought. Ah, I remember you. And then they clash a little bit and they fight and it's like giant explosions. It's like really epic. And after all the smoke settles, they approach each other like, ah, yes, I missed you. Good man. Yes, exactly. It's kind of like that, except Ichika is once again, she's like a little kid. And so she fights against Ikaku and Ikaku, like they have like wooden swords like Boken. So they're just like, you know, Ikaku is just like a, the deflecting and parrying all the attacks. It's not a big deal. And then Ichika lands on the roof and just like, ah, master, you know, you almost bested me this time. You're improving your sword skills. So very arrogant. And, you know, you can tell right away that's Renji's kid, right? Okay. So anyway, yeah, Ikaku's there and just like, you know, hey, you little brat, you know, I'm the one that's your master. You should listen to me when I'm instructing you and everything like that. Uh, Yuma Chika shows up. Kind of an awkward scene there when, when Yuma Chika walks into the room, Ichika kind of turns to him and just like, Good morning, Chika-san. You look very beautiful today. And, you know, Yuma Chika's like, oh, thank you. And so it was kind of like, is like that the way he prefers for people to, like, greet him? Like, if you greet me, if you could call me beautiful, that would be magnificent because that's very Yuma Chika. Anyway, Yumachika goes over to Ikaku. Remember, Ikaku is the vice captain of Squad 11 now. So Yumachika's like, did you get the report? Did you get the message, Ikaku? And Ikaku's like, what report? And Yumachika's like, ah, see, I knew this is why I showed up. I knew that you were going to forget. I knew you weren't going to pay attention to it, all right? So now we get the premise, the main plot of this chapter. We cut over to Renji's quarters, you know, Abarai Renji, you know, the lieutenant of Squad 6, and he's calling Ichigo over on the soul pager, all right? And he's basically saying something about the Konso Reisai. So remember, the Konso is the soul burial. It's the technique that all Shinigami use with their Zanpak toes, taking their Zanpak toe. This is not a Zanpak toe I remember from Bleach. Looks pretty cool, though. I wonder what a Shikai and Bankai is. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, you know, you take the, uh, basically the hilt of the Zanpak toe, and you kind of, like, stamp the head of the plus, and it gives, like, that, like, the, you know, the symbol of the Konso, like, approved, and then the soul ascends to the soul society. Okay, so that's the general premise with the Konso. Well, this is the Konso Reisai, which means, hold on, soul burial ceremony ritual, or just the soul funeral, or whatever way, whatever translation you want to say, okay? It's a little bit different, and it's a very special kind of event that doesn't always happen only under certain circumstances does this uh, Konso Reisai occur. 
So Renji's giving Ichigo the explanation for this Konso Reisai over the Soul Pager, which are now resembling just modern day smartphones and iPhones or whatever. He's like, yeah, Ichigo, it's called the Konso Reisai. I've never done one myself. We don't usually have to do it. But every 12 years after the funeral of a captain that's died in battle specifically, we got to perform this special ritual to like put their souls to rest, essentially. Okay. And I wanted to invite you to it. And so Ichigo, meanwhile, he's like on the phone in the world of living. He's just like, oh, that's cool. So, so what do you do? at a Konso Reisai. I've never even heard of this. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's pretty standard. Basically, we all just get together. We meet early in the morning. We pick some flowers. We go to the grave. We slaughter a hollow, spill its blood in front of the grave of the captain. And then afterwards, you know, we pray and then we go to get ice cream after. Pretty much anything like that. Ichigo's like, whoa, 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 wait, what? What was that about ice cream? It's like, oh yeah, ice cream. It's a tradition. It's like, no, 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 the hollow. It's like, oh yes, okay. So it's a bit of a archaic tradition, as Renji states. You know, it really does sound like some sacrificial stuff. He's just like, oh yeah, you know how it is. Uh, we have this old parchment here. It's been a while since we've had to do one of these cones so race eyes because captains do not often die in battle. You know, obviously Yamamoto, Unohana, and Uketake died during the last arc, which is what this is covering right now. Um, but normally it's not a standard thing. For a very, very long time, there was really no major trouble in the Soul Society, right? Up until, like, well, coincidentally, right when the Bleach series started, oddly enough, right? That's when Aizen enacted his plan and Yuha decided to do invade and all that stuff, right? Well, anyway, it's like it's like Renji dusts off this old scroll, like, you know, hear ye, hear ye, when a Shinigami captain is to die in battle, they must be remembered by the slaughtering of a hollow in front of their grave. You know, make sure all of the blood spills out of their polluted corpses. You know, like, that's kind of what they're doing here. And so Ichigo's a little bit hesitant, like, uh, all right, I, I, I guess I could go to that, I suppose. And Anyway, by the way, it's a little noisy where I'm at right now. And Renji's like, yeah, where are you? And so Keigo, Ichigo's friend from high school, opened up a ramen shop called Spirit Ramen or a Willpower Ramen, okay? And so Ichigo is hanging out at this ramen place right now with Mizuiro, and Keigo's there, and he's just like, hey, I got one bowl of ramen for you here. And, you know, Mizuiro and Keigo are having a little bit of back and forth. Like, Mizuiro's like, Keigo, could you please stop yelling? You know, Mr. Owner of this establishment, could you stop yelling? My friend's on the phone. He's like, don't call me Owner. I'm Keigo. You know me. And there's, like, nobody else in the freaking ramen shop except one other person that's off to the side, and it sort of looks like Uryu. And Uryu is still in Karakura Town. He's a doctor at the hospital. He's like, just like Ryukin was. So I'm thinking that might be Uryu's cameo, but other than that, it might just be some random dude that wandered into the ramen shop, but it does look like Uryu, so there's his cameo for the uh, chapter, if that is very well him. Um, but at any rate, then Rukia walks in, and Rukia is so cute, she's got like a side ponytail now, which is like, Aah! and so Rukia comes in, and she looks at Renji, and she's talking to, he's talking to Ichigo, he's like FaceTiming Ichigo on like Zoom, or like Google Duo, or whatever, and so, you know, he's like, oh, is this, is this one of these new, uh, uh, these newfangled soul pagers that have the screen. And so somebody, I mentioned this in the live stream and one of my fans was like, it's like Rukia is a grandma learning how to use a phone. And that's totally the, the accurate description of what this is. Cause Rukia even says like, oh, I've been using the regular soul pager up until now, like the old flip phone, because there's no reason to update it. So Rukia is like that. He's like, hey, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I have my flip phone, it's fine. But now Rukia is looking at like, wow, this is crazy. I can see your face so clearly. Ichigo. I guess, uh, I guess the Soul Society gets good, like, 5G service. I don't know. And Ichigo's like, yeah, by the way, how is all that a, a thing over there? Because then Rukia starts making references to, like, hey, if I see Orihime, if I turn the screen this way, and Ichigo's like, no, she's at home doing laundry. And Rukia's like, oh, are you in that kind of relationship where you make your wife do everything and you go off on your own and you're, you're still living under the same roof just for the sake of your children, but you really have a massive amount of emotional abuse going on? <laughs> just like, and Ichigo's like, what the hell? Where did you get that from? He's like, oh, we got television now. I was watching soap operas and sitcoms the other day. <laughs> oh my god. All right. This is great. This is beautiful. Okay. Uh, all right. So, Urahara, after the war, because I guess his, you know, expulsion, his exile from the Soul Society was lifted at that point, considering he helped in such a big way. So Urahara has since just been introducing brand new technology and converting it into reishi and introducing it into the Soul Society. This is, like, at first, this is just kind of comical, like, not really a joke, it's just an interesting little factoid. Like, the Shinigami now have smartphones. In the Seireite, there's TV and whatever. 
whatever. But no, no, you don't understand. It goes way more beyond that, all right? I want you to picture this, because later on in this chapter, it's implied they even have, like, social media and stuff, okay? So, Uahara brings the internet into the Seirete. And there's, like, a soul society, like, like, Rukia can connect to, like, Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or whatever. And it's like, would there be Shinigami memes? Like, would the Shinigami, like, you know, log on to their Facebook account, like, create memes or of, like, cats or whatever? Like, Rukia's would be bunnies, but you know what I mean. Like, Rukia gets a DeviantArt account and, like, makes artwork and, like, puts it up. Like, this... This is crazy because it's symbolic of, like, kind of what Yuha was doing. Yuha wanted to do, like, an actual merging of the dimensions into one universe, one existence, okay? And so we're, we're kind of contrasting that with not a merging of literal dimensions, but a merging of culture and pop culture and media and social media and all that stuff crossing through the dimensional pathways through the Dongai so the Soul Society now has this. It's insane. I also want to mention the year that we're really working with here, okay? So it's been 12 years since the end of Bleach, all right? Bleach started in 2001 because this is the 20th anniversary. That's when Ichigo first met Rukia in May of 2001, okay? And then all of the stuff with the Soul Society and the fake Karakura Town arc, that all happens within like a year because Ichigo is still in school. He has to miss a lot of school because of his Shinigami duties, but you know, it's still in the same year. And then there's a 17-month time skip to, like, 2003, uh, where Ichigo is now a senior in high school, and that's when the Fullbringer arc and then the Thousand Year Blood War arc take place. Ichigo's 17 at the beginning of that. He might be 18, maybe close to that at the end of, uh, the, the ending of, uh, you know, when he defeats Yuha. And then we have a 10-year time skip into the future to 2013 or so, and then we have another two-year time skip here with this chapter, okay? So right now, for all intents and purposes, it should be around like 2015 2016 in the bleach universe that's something to keep in mind uh whereas like for a long time up until the end of bleach chapter 680 almost uh, well, chapter 684 which was the last chapter in the present and then it skips into the future bleach was taking place in like 2003 all right so here we are now in 2015 2016 with all this modern technology social media computers networks and all that kind of crap there it's really crazy um i just wanted to mention that as like it's 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 a cool little concept that Uohara is doing this, and he's also doing it just to kind of mess with Mayori as well, because uh, Mayori was like the one that was the head of research and development, and now Uohara is like, oh, well, I could get you guys smartphones and internet and freaking, like, you know, Netflix and Disney Plus. Like, I could get all of that stuff into the Seireite, and I don't even know. I wonder how Yamamoto would have responded to that, because Yamamoto is much like a traditionalist, and he's like 2,000 years old, uh, or at least he was before he died. Um, I wonder if we're going to ever get to see him again. Probably not. But anyway, yeah, I wonder how Yamamoto or some like the older guard would have responded to this, you know? Um, and so it's it's like a, it's a changing of the guard. It's the generations are moving on. Keep in mind, the Shinigami don't really age all that much, okay? So for like 12 years to a Shinigami is not that big of a deal. Like Ikaku, Yumachika, all of the other captains, they look pretty much exactly the same as they did 12 years ago because Shinigami can live hundreds, even thousands of years, right? And so 12 years to them is probably only like a few months relative to a human or something. It's not that long. Um, but, you know, their culture had a huge boom uh, with all of the stuff that Uohara brought over. So very, very interesting there. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's that nice little bit there between Rukia and Renji, and they're talking on the phone. And then all of a sudden, Mayuri Kurotsuchi shows up as they're talking about all this technology and like, man, it's really great that Uohara brought all this technology into the Seirete. Man, Mayuri must be really upset. And then Mayuri shows up like, I am not, you fools! And so Mayuri arrives there in the middle of the 13th Division. Now, it's not, I guess it's not the 13th Division. It's Renji's quarters in the 6th Division. Whatever. He shows up as a hologram, and Rukia's like, ah, what? And so she's like phasing right through him and we see you know how uh, Mayori had those little bugs he had these like really creepy like Frankenstein bugs like that he added various devices to and the bugs were like you know scattering all over the Seirete as like surveillance cameras basically he has all the soul society literally bugged because he's Mayori anyway these are bugs that are kind of like flies that project holograms and he's doing this all over the uh, Seirete projecting in front of every single vice captain of the Gote 13 so Renji's there so that's why he's projecting 
thing right there, okay? Um, and they're like, oh my god, this is disgusting. You know, Uohara is bringing in smartphones and stuff. You still have these weird, freaky Frankenstein cyborg insects, you know, flying around. I'm gonna squish it. Ruki is like, I'm gonna squish it. And Mayori's like, ha! Ah, even if you squish the bug, you fool, I've spread them all over the area. And they're like, that sounds like something you would say in the middle of battle, which it totally is. Like, you could you could picture Mayori fighting against Pernida or Salaporo Grants and being just like, it's like, ah, I have already spread all of my spirit insects across the battlefield. You squash one and another will appear, you fool. You know, so that's, that's Mayori right there. Okay, so Mayori arrives and he doesn't even have to do this. They have regular communication. They have the Tente Kura network. He doesn't need to use the hologram bugs all over the place, but, you know, it's it's implied because Urahara is sort of getting a one-up on everything with the technology boom. Uh, Mayori has to, like, reiterate that, like, I am the true scientist of the Shinigami! Damn you, Kisuke Urahara! I will project my holograms all over the place! I will burn the Seireite down, Urahara! So, anyway, he begins to announce to everybody, hey, hey, um, remember that the ceremony is beginning soon, and one of the steps here is that all of the vice captains need to get together, go to the world of the living, and they need to slay or capture a hollow, not slay a hollow, capture a hollow, bring it back to the Soul Society so it can be killed in front of the grave of the captain. It was also explained they already did the soul funeral for Yamamoto and for Unohana a couple of days prior to this. So this is not like an unusual thing. Like, they're kind of like, alright, they haven't done it in a while, but they did, they just did it twice in a row in like the last few weeks or days or whatever. So it's like, all right, let's go to the world of the living. Let's catch a hollow, bring it back to the soul society. Okay. And Mayuri is just relaying this message. Uh, Isane and Hanatoro at the fourth division, they're freaking out over this. They're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, Captain Kurotsuchi. And you see Shinji and Momo. Little side note, we see the inside of the fifth division barracks with Shinji and he has like an, an album collection on the back, like classic vinyl collection because it's Shinji. He likes listening to records and stuff. So he has a music collection back there. That's pretty nice. Um, we see the 6th Division where Ichika is arriving home, and so she kind of sees the projection of Mayori, and Ichika's like, oh wow, that's Mayori Kuritsuchi, Captain of Squad 12, he's so cool, and so Ichika kind of hides to listen to the message, so she's like overhearing it, which what Mayori's uh, saying to Renji and Rukia. Uh, by the way, Ichika, you know, Mayori is a pretty cool captain in terms of like design and abilities, and his fights are always really intricate, but uh, yeah, he's, he's a pretty messed up individual, like he pretty much like, you know, vivisected a bunch of Quincy's, including Uryu's grandfather. Mayuri is not a good person. Maybe maybe you should pick somebody else to idolize, Ichika. I'm just saying, right? Uh, anyway, like, literally anybody else would probably be more of a positive influence than Mayuri Kuritsuchi. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, okay. Uh, Nanao heads out. Okakiba, the other First Division lieutenant, stays behind uh, at the at the barracks. We see Moreccio and Soifone. Moreccio grew his hair out a little bit, so he has a little bit of a pompadour, but he's kind of balding, so he doesn't have much of one, but he does have a little bit more hair. Uh, maybe Urahara brought back some, like, Rogaine or something, and Moreccio's like, I get my hair back! Sweet! Then we cut over to the 7th Division barracks, where we see Iba, and Iba's like, oh, okay, uh, somebody let Atau know. Atau, A-T-A-U, uh, the new lieutenant of the 7th Division, because all of the lieutenants need to gather, and then the captains are the ones, I think, that actually slay the hollow. So the vice captains capture, captains slay, and then that's the Konso Reisai right there in a nutshell. So, the new, uh, Lieutenant of Squad 7 is uh, Rindo Atau, and he is just hanging out with a bunch of wild animals, like there's some deer there and some birds, just like uh, some burbs just floating around him, and Iba's like, hey Atau, uh, did you get the message? You gotta go to the World of the Living, you gotta report for the Konso Reisai, and Atau just kind of turns to him and just makes uh, some sign language gestures to say, oh, it's okay, Captain, I've I've heard and I'll be there, okay? So Atau, this is actually really interesting, and we're gonna get to that in a little bit uh, with Ichigo when uh, Renji explains it, but Atau is actually a deaf character, and I wasn't sure at first. Uh, some people were thinking he might have just been mute and he talks with sign language, but later on in the chapter, Renji does say that, you know, he can read lips to understand you. So no, he's a deaf character, and that does not really come up a lot in manga. First thing that I thought of was a silent voice, which if you've never read that, please go read it. It's a very good manga, very heartwarming story there. Um, but yeah, we just don't see a lot of deaf characters in manga, period, so that's really cool that Kubo would include um, Atau here, right? And I took a semester of 
of uh, American Sign Language when I was in college. That was like, oh man, that was six years ago already, so I'm not even going to attempt anything. I've kind of like forgot a lot of it. Uh, but I would really recommend it. If you're in college or about to go to college and you have to take a foreign language like most colleges require. So if it does require one, check to see if there is a uh, sign language course there. Okay, and it's cool for a bunch of reasons. You know, number one, you learn sign language and like at the time I actually knew quite a bit, not so much anymore. I haven't really kept up with it, uh, but I learned, I picked that up more than I did when I tried to learn Spanish in high school because I couldn't really learn Spanish at all. But sign language, I actually learned a decent amount, enough to actually pass the class. Um, but also you learn about deaf culture along the way. And I didn't really know anything about deaf culture. So there was a lot of stuff to learn and it was just a really like enlightening kind of um, environment there in that course, okay? So I'd recommend it, but yeah, really cool character there. And we get introduced to another vice captain who is the new vice captain of uh, Lisa's division, division eight. Uh, so we'll get that coming up soon, all right? So kind of all the vice captains are just gathering together now. There is a fun scene where Rongiku is there listening to Mayuri's hologram message, and she says like, oh, well, I think Mayuri's just jealous because of all the new merchandise that, you know, Uahara's bringing in and everything, or, you know, whatever. And so then... This is funny. So it's like Mayori is broadcasting to everybody at once so he can hear everything they are saying. And so he responds in kind. But when he responds, he responds to every single connection. So when Rangiku kind of makes fun of him, he's like, that's not true, you you fool. And then he fires laser eyes and like explodes on the floor. And so, but it doesn't hit Rangiku. It hits Shuhei because Shuhei's in the ninth division. He's like, whoa, what? He's like, do not tell Never call my stuff merchandise. He's like, I'm not even the one that said that. That was somebody else. You could fire laser holograms. He's like, of course I can fire laser holograms. Poor Mayori. By the way, his new outfit looks pretty cool, you know. Uh, he's got, like, tags all over him as, like, you know, uh, like, I don't even know what you call these things, but imagine, like, they're tags or whatever. And then he has, like, a Herculean beetle antler things on his head, like a crown. It's Mayori. It's really interesting to see whatever way he's going to dress. I kind of like the way he was dressing at the end of Bleach with, like, the giant, like, Lucifer horns, like that was pretty sweet. Okay, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Bleach chapters usually didn't take this long to review. I've been in here for like over an hour and uh, it's like 95 degrees outside in a room with lights and no insulation, no air conditioning, wearing like a three piece suit. So, uh, hmm. I was getting kind of woozy, so I had to stop the review, to be honest with you. All right. Mm. So we're going to continue, but we're going to do it in a little bit more of a casual fashion. Casual bleach review. I really wouldn't do this if it just wasn't unbearably hot in that suit, okay? So anyway, where do we leave off? Okay. So the vice captains are all now gathering in the world of the living for this Konso Reisai, and Ichigo arrives with them too. And he, there's a little bit of an argument between Ichigo and Renji, because Renji's like, you don't even need to be here. And he's like, you invited me. He's like, to the Reisai thing in the Soul Society, not to this. He's like, well, I don't know what you do, man. Man. But you know what? I really like their back and forth, their discussions, and it really just highlights that Ichigo, for the most part, for the last 12 years, he's had just like a normal life in the world of living with uh, Orihime and Kazui, his son. I'm sure he does the deputy Shinigami thing every once in a while. Like if there's a hollow like right there, he'll turn into a Shinigami and kill it or whatever like that. But for the most part, there's probably other Shinigami that patrol Karakura Town, just like um, uh, Kuro Marani. Remember the Afro Shinigami? You know, he's there and then there's probably other Shinigami along the way. And so Ichigo probably doesn't really have to do a lot of stuff. And that's so good. That's so awesome that Ichigo just gets a normal life, you know, because he's not like Naruto. He didn't want to become like the Hokage or like, you know, I want to be the captain commander of the Shinigami of the Gotei 13. That's not Ichigo. Ichigo just kind of, you get the impression, just wanted an ordinary life. And that was explained, you know, in the Fullbringer arc after the time skip, after Ichigo lost his powers, he was talking about, you know, going to college and what he was going to do and everything like that and he really doesn't like to be thrust into these life or death kind of situations now at this point it's been 12 years Ichigo is like perfectly fine with his Shinigami powers and he's trained and he's strong and all that stuff but that's not his focus his focus is not like okay I'm gonna go to the Soul Society and go to the captain meeting and learn about what's going on and we're gonna do an offensive and fight against these hollows that is not Ichigo if they really 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 needed his help with something like if something so crazy occurred like 
the gates of hell opening up or something, um, then they would probably ask Ichigo for assistance. But for the most part, that's what the Gotei 13 is for, right? They're not going to ask Ichigo to come and help them with every little thing. Like, hey, Ichigo, there's a hollow. Can you go kill it? And it's like, can you not send anybody else? I'm spending the day with my wife and my kid at the amusement park, right? It's like, oh, I guess we could send, like, a fifth seat officer or whatever. Yeah, please do. So that's not Ichigo's life, okay? Every once in a while, he might patrol, but that's it. For the most part, he has a normal job. After high school, he went to college, started marrying, uh, started marrying, started dating Orihime, then married Orihime, and then they had a kid together. And they just stay at home and, you know, just, you know, do the family thing. And that's perfect for Ichigo. I can't think of a better way for Ichigo's character to be resolved, okay? And all of this, by the way, feels very natural, the way Kubo sets it up, because, you know, it is natural for Ichigo and everybody. It's been 12 years at this point. This is just the standard order of affairs. This Konso Reisai kind of came out of nowhere. But other than that, it's just like, yeah, hanging out. You get the impression Ichigo and Renji and Rukia and maybe the other lieutenants, whenever they're in town, maybe they'll go out drinking somewhere. Maybe sometime Ichigo goes to the Soul Society and drinks with them. But it's more of just like visiting friends rather than like a work thing or, you know, fighting against hollows or anything like that. And even Rangiku brings it up here. It's like, hey, after we're done uh, capturing this hollow and we bring it back to the Soul Society, do you want to go out for a drink, Ichigo? And Renji's like, oh, are you free tonight? Can you go drinking? And Renji, I mean, Ichigo's like, oh, yeah, I don't have a deadline for a couple of days, so I should be able to go. And Rangiku's like, oh, okay, well, what do you do for a living? And he's like, oh, I'm a translator. So Ichigo's a translator. That's awesome. He went to college, and I don't know why he's a translator specifically or what he really does with his job, but it's an actual job. It's a real job. You gotta put money and food on the table somehow, right? Okay. And somebody brought this up, and I didn't even think of this right away, but Burn the Witch takes place in this same universe. There's a Soul Society West Branch in Burn the Witch, okay? And in Burn the Witch, that's over in England and London and Reverse London, where they speak English, of course. And so over here, you have Ichigo living in Japan. You could do a crossover now with Ichigo meeting Noel uh, and Nina, and, you know, he could speak, I'm, I'm assuming maybe he's a Japanese to English translator. That would probably make the most sense, because that way you could have both of these series connect to each other. So that's really cool. But yeah, Ichigo just has an ordinary, normal life for the most part, and it's just like every now and then I turn into a Shinigami and I have a giant sword. Whatever, it's cool. It's pretty normal, you know. But at the same time, he helps Kazui with, like, his homework or whatever. So I, I like that. That was Ichigo's reward, and he doesn't need anything more than that. He doesn't need to become the Soul King or have god powers or anything like that. He just needs to have his normal life with his family, right? Um, so yeah, they're just hanging around talking. Renji introduces uh, Rindo Atau to Ichigo, explains, you know, oh, well, do you know sign language because he doesn't speak? And Ichigo's like, no, unfortunately, I don't know sign language. And Rindo nods and he signs to him. He's like, oh, it's okay. I'm fine with that. You know, I can read lips. It's okay. I understand what you're saying and everything. You know, there's no, no problem with it or anything. And uh, then you also have the other new vice captain that's introduced here, uh, Yu Yu Yayahara, right? I got that right. Yeah, Yu Yu Yayahara. Okay. So she shows up, right? Now, she is the lieutenant under Lisa. This is about to make a lot of sense really quick. Um, she has a very bubbly, very expressive personality. Her Shinigami outfit is very reminiscent of Lisa's. And Renji explains that she's really into the Gyaru trend in the world of the living, in like a subculture of Japan. And Ichigo's like, we don't even have Gyaru's like that in the world of the living. You know, this is like overblown. Okay. So I had to do research on what this is, Gyaru. I didn't even know what this was. Okay. So... Do you remember the 90s? <laughs> That's the best way for me to start this. All right. In the 90s, in a lot of television and movies, there was sort of like this um, archetype of a character, like the valley girl. Like, oh my God, I'm going to go to the mall and get a smoothie. And you know, that, that kind of character. Okay. And sometimes it was dialed up and sometimes it was more normal. Uh, if you ever watched uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, like the original Power Rangers series, Kimberly, the pink ranger in the early seasons sort of embodied that like valley girl kind of archetype of that character. Okay. And so that over here eventually made its way to Japan and it became its own thing over there called Gyaru or gal or girl, gal, Gyaru. Okay. Okay, so that's where that comes from. And that was back in the 90s and was when it started. So it's been 30 years since then, obviously. Oh my God. <sighs> 
it's been 30 years since then already since the 90s so the fashion and like the makeup that she wears and everything it's like reminiscent of that style evolved throughout the decades that's the best way i got it at any rate she's got a phone she's got a soul page or a smartphone and she's going up to ichigo like hi i'm yaya i mean you you yaya hara ichigo get an insta pic with me and so she's taking pictures with ichigo and everything and i thought that this character was going to be kind of annoying at first but once again when i stepped back and really understood the bigger picture this makes sense because as we said all the technology that's like you know seeping into the soul society now and uh she even mentions here like oh i'll add you online lisa captain lisa gave me your line account number and each goes like how did she even know my account number how do you guys have line you know and it's like uruhara installed it and each goes like damn him you know so he's like he's bringing like snapchat and instagram and like tiktok into the seirete oh uruhara you are a devious bastard if there ever was one i would say he's probably laughing hilariously we don't even see uruhara in this chapter or yoroichi or a tessai or anybody really um but yeah no this character isn't really annoying because it makes sense for number one being lisa's lieutenant and lisa was one of the visors that really like you know um got attached to the life in the world of the living you know like for example love like to read shonen jump lisa you know had the outfit you know the, the school outfit and she also uh, read all of the fashion magazines and the swimsuit magazines and other kinds of magazines that was lisa okay and even as a captain she still wears like a schoolgirl uniform with like the midriff showing even as the captain of the gote 13 i wonder how yamamoto would have felt about that but no anyway it makes sense that this would be lisa's lieutenant because lisa probably embodies like if uohara really is bringing like snapchat instagram tiktok all of the social media into the soul society lisa would be the first person that would like accept that and put it all over her division all right so it would make sense that yu yu would be you know like welcoming of that as well and she bases her personality around a japanese subculture of gyaru all right so there you go also both of these characters rindo and yu yu both unique in their own uh, individual ways also have really cool combat abilities that we are going to see in a little bit here all right so she's like driving the phone and she's like ichigo take an insta pic with me and ichigo's like no he's like i'll put a filter on i'm like no don't don't put a filter no and so anyway meanwhile ichika has arrived in the world of the living as well she arrived through one of the senkai mon gates and there's a hell butterfly next to her as well and so she's there and she's looking up and she sees you know renji and ichigo talking and everything and she's like yes i managed to get here without being detected i'm gonna see what's going on with all these hollows and everything it's gonna be crazy so then she looks up and she sees I don't even know how to properly describe it. It's like a hollow with like bones and stuff missing. Actually, you know what? I know somebody that's been to hell. Hey, Rad Teching, come on in here. Rad Teching, come on in. Anytime, man. Okay, I guess he's still in hell. Well, we'll figure that out later, I guess. Um, or maybe not. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's these weird, like, hell skeleton creatures that just appear behind Renji and Ichigo, and they don't seem to sense them or hear them. And only Ichika is the one that can see them at the moment. So she shouts up like, Father, watch out! And Renji's like, Ichika, what are you doing? It's past your bedtime. Bam! And then Renji just gets smacked by this giant bone, you know, hollow thing and gets knocked into the ground. Ichigo's response, is great so by the way the other shinigami can see these things it's not like ichika is special and like she's the only one that could see them i thought that at first but no they just don't admit riatsu so they can't sense them but you know actually physically seeing them they can they just kind of like appear out of nowhere and they can't be sensed okay so renji gets smacked by this thing into the freaking building below ichigo takes like his sword and just kind of like and it just like is disintegrated like its limbs its body just gets shredded by one swing of ichigo's sword okay which by the way i have to say is his regular shikai now so that's a big question a lot of people have like what happened to you know ichigo's original not his original but what happened to ichigo's dual wielding swords that he had back during the thousand year blood war arc remember that whole thing we went through the whole thing with the asuchi and the forging and nimaya like those are your real zanpaktos how do you like those zangetsus right and so this is how ichigo fought and now he's just back to his regular old shikai again all right so i have a few theories about this uh one of them is that remember ichigo's true bankai was that sword so maybe ichigo is either in his constant bankai or remember 
the connection that Ichigo had with his Zanpakuto was a little bit different than the connection that every other Shinigami had. Like, Ichigo went, like, next level with the Shinigami and Zanpakuto connection and everything and that, he, that he went through throughout the last arc and getting to know the nature of his true powers and everything. So it's possible he could have just met with um, the Zangetsu and other Zangetsu, you know, the version of Yuha inside of him or whatever, and he might have just met with them and just be like, hey, I, I want the original, can I have my original Shikai back? And they're like, okay. And like, there you go. And now he has his original Shikai. Like, he can make it whatever shape he wants, maybe. Uh, that's like the true essence of Ichigo's power was that first sword, right? Um, also, you know, keep in mind, it's been 12 years. So literally any number of things could happen. This is not like Ichigo had his dual wield and then the next chapter takes place the next week and he doesn't have it anymore. 12 years have gone by here, guys. 12, all right? So any number of things could have occurred, but Ichigo might have just preferred his original um, Zanpakuto Shikai better. He's just more used to fighting with it. So he had it changed back. Maybe Mayuri made some modifications. Maybe Urahara did. Maybe he talked with uh, Nimaya after this. You know, any number of things could have happened. Um, but he has his regular Shikai again, and I think it looks very fitting on him. I mean, that's typical Ichigo. That's standard Ichigo right there. I mean, what other way would you like it, right? The dual wield was cool. Maybe he could still go into that form if he wants to. Um, there's also the question, like, did Ichigo's Quincy powers get removed from him after Yuha ripped out all of his powers? Um, and they were given back to him, kind of. But it's like, it's, it's very nebulous exactly what the situation with Ichigo's powers are. But suffice to say, he's still wicked strong. Just one swing of his sword is able to just kill this thing in one hit, okay? But, unfortunately... That wasn't the only one. Uh, there's a lot more, and they're all charging at all the vice captains, and they cannot be sent, so that makes the battle a little bit difficult. Remember what Shunsui said when he fought against Lilia, how a lot of Shinigami and, like, Quincy's that can sense Riatsu start to really see more through Riatsu than their physical eyes, like actual senses, okay? And this can actually cause, like, a desynchronization of the senses where you might think you hit somebody, but you actually didn't, and that was the whole thing with Lilia and Shunsui. So maybe that's a thing there, where the Shinigami are so finely tuned to reacting based on Riatsu rather than their actual sense of sight or sound, then at that point, maybe they're kind of caught off guard. It's like, what? What? We can't sense the Riatsu? We have to go analog with this? Oh, shit. And so they're all attacking uh, Kione Kotetsu, uh, Isane's younger sister and the vice captain of Squad 4. She gets stabbed right through the damn chest and she is grabbed by Sentaru Kotsubaki. Remember, Sentaru and Kione were both the dual third seats of the 13th Division under Ukitake. Ukitake died and then Rukia, Rukia became the next captain of the 13th Division. Kione went to be the vice captain of the 4th Division under Isane, her older sister, and then Sentaro stayed behind as the official vice captain of the 13th Division. And he has, like, a cool, like, the 13th uh, badge on his back and everything like that, and so he picks up Kione. Like, it's okay, you gotta fight, guys! And so we see them all release their Zanpaktos, you know, Marechio fights, Ikaku's there, and everybody, they're fighting. And so we get to see uh, both uh, Rindo Atao and Yuyu Yaya, Yuyu Yaya Hara, I'm gonna mess that up a bunch of times, use their individual battle skills, okay? So first, we see um, Rindo release his Zanpakuto. Now remember, he's deaf and he's mute. He doesn't speak. So how's he going to release his Zanpakuto? This is actually really cool. He takes out his Zanpakuto and he like forms like some reishi on his fingertip and then he literally writes the release command, give birth, ume, on the blade of the sword, writes it in the kanji, in the hiragana, and then, boom, his sword is released. And then he signs the name of his sword, Taka, or Hawk. So it's, give birth, Hawk. Give birth, Taka. And so I just think that's a really cool idea. Like, he could still fight. Like, just because he's deaf and he's mute doesn't mean that he can't fight like the other Shinigami. He can release his sword. He has his Zanpakuto just like everybody else. It's just the way he does it is a little different. Very unique kind of way to show that, though. So he releases his Zanpakuto, and as the name implies, it turns into a bunch of hawks. Uh, at first, they turn into a bunch of these little paper tags. Uh, they remember, like, uh, Shikigami. I think they're called, like, little little paper dolls in Japanese. Um, if you've ever seen Fairy Tale, Ivan, uh, Makarov's son, and um, uh, Loxus's dad in Fairy Tale, the boss of Raventail, has magic that summons, like, these kind of things, like Shikigami, okay? So his sword turns into a bunch of these tags, and then the tags all turn into hawks, and it's just this entire group. I don't know exactly what a large... I know it's a murder of crows. I don't know, a flock of hawks or whatever. Flock of hawks! A flock of hawks just all turn together, and they just go after one of these uh, hollow, these hell creatures, attack it, and they just pass through, and they just, like, rip this thing's flesh off of its body. So just like a flock of birds just... 
wash over in this thing, and then just nothing but skeleton afterwards. It's just like, ah! It just gets devoured whole by these birds, and then it hits the ground and it dies. That is badass. It just devours everything in its wake. This is the real bird demic right here. And then you have uh, Yu Yu, who does not use a Zompocto. Instead, she jumps on one of these uh, creatures, and every step she takes, like, cracks the shit out of this thing's spine. So, like, every act of her, like, stepping is like breaking this thing apart and then she takes her hands and then she does this movement right here like the jaws of like a bear or something and then very well a symbol of a bear appears behind her and then she's like gow gow being like roar or howl in japanese gow and then she just does this with her uh, fingernails like bringing it down and a giant like just basically like a huge bear just took a bite out of this hollow oh just gets devoured and then she does it again and bites its crotch out like that the crotch of this thing just disappears not that they have genitals but it just got like he's like ha ha and so that's really cool she also has like uh, her nails are painted with like a bear paw and like fangs and stuff on her nails and so she brings it down I don't know if that's a keto I don't know if that's her zompocto like she releases her zompocto maybe gives her a boost to like her um, physical powers or something very unusual but not unheard of so that's really cool there so we get to see those two and then we also get to see Akon Akon we've seen him before in the story but now he's in the front lines he is now a vice captain of the Gote 13, he was just working for the research and development. He was the third seat, but he mostly just stayed in the uh, laboratory. So now we see Akon, he takes out this little cylinder and he's super cool when doing it. He doesn't even seem like afraid. So this giant like hell hollow is like charging toward him. He takes out this little tube, tosses it on the ground. And he's like 333-444-7354-13941, you know, 8675349, melt. And then it just turns into this like giant pool of acid. And then the hollow just... Yeah! Just gets devoured in this pool of acid. Oh my god. So obviously Kubo wanted to focus on Rindo and uh, Yu Yu and Akon because they're like the newest uh, members of the vice captains that we see. Um, and just like how we were introduced to all the captains in the last chapter, we got to be introduced to the vice captains here. So that's a great way to do that. Um, and then we have a special guest, Kira. Izuru Kira appears and uses his Zanpakuto uh, Wabiske to increase the weight of one of these hollows and he does it instantaneously he's just like seven times the weight <sighs> So it's like with one attack, he might be able to increase the weight seven times, or he does seven attacks so damn quick. So one of the hollows just falls to the ground. He walks up, puts it behind its neck, and just decapitates the damn thing. And so Akon's there, and he's like, Izuru, maybe you should stop, you know, patrolling the perimeter by yourself. It's a nasty habit of yours. And Izuru, he has a hood on. He's so cool. He's like he's like the emo brooding member of the Gote 13. He takes off the hood. He's, he's always by himself. He doesn't really hang out with the others. He just takes off his hood and he's just like i like working the perimeter it's the solitude you know it's like oh my god he's so so emo but you know what it makes sense given the fact he's kind of like a weird cyborg creation of mayori he's like missing his chest i don't know what it looks like right now because he's wearing his shiok show we don't see like what he looks like i think it was shown in the can't fear your own world novel that like that form causes him intense pain like you know go figure having a giant gaping hole in your chest and then brought back from death is is painful in the slightest it's like creaking and there's like oil is leaking or whatever like it's not fun uh maybe they improved it since then i i would i would go to orihime Izuru, if i was Izuru, i'd be like orihime can you please either either heal me or you know do something else to put me out of my misery i don't know god this is hell you know i didn't ask for this you know mayori just did this to me so i feel bad for him but he seems to be getting along okay. He's sort of like the Batman of the Gote 13 right now. So whatever, let's just roll with that. So anyway, the vice captains, yeah, they might have taken some damage. Kione is injured and everything, but it seems like they are handling it right now. So Renji is about to go help them after making sure Ichika is okay. And then all of a sudden, another gate to hell opens up behind him. And it's the same form we saw earlier in the chapter with Kazui and the, uh, the Plus and Cone and everybody. It's a portal that looks like the Garganta with teeth on each side. And that opens like raw and then Siloporo grants like appears out of the muck in the goo of hell because hell is covered with goo apparently it comes out like ah it's been so long about i renji and renji's like i know that voice you're Siloporo grants aren't you dead he's like oh yes I am dead. And remember, we saw Siloporo and Arenyaro Arurueri in hell in the prelude to the Hellverse. By the way, the Hellverse, 
I think maybe the idea of hell, like the way it looks in that movie might be adapted here, but in terms of like the characters we met, like Shuren and Kokuto and everybody like that, I don't think they're going to play a role here in hell. I don't know if Ichigo is going to get the badass skull armor that he got in the movie, um, but for right now it seems very different because the way that Kubo is depicting Sile now as he's emerging from hell is very different from the way the other, um, uh, oh, what were they called? Um, they were called, I think I have it written down here, Togabito, the Togabito, the sinners of hell. Sia looks very, very different from them, okay? He has his hollow hole floating behind him now, and he has horns, and he's all warped and mangled and everything. And he says, Oh, hell is actually a nice place. You take your hollow hole, which is the representation of all the loneliness and emptiness inside of you, and it moves to the outside of your body. Do you understand, Renji Abarai? All of my emotions, all of my, my hatred and rage and loneliness, it just spills out of me like tears. And as he's saying this, this like goo, like blood, viscous substance, I don't know what the hell it is, it's just oozing out of his horns and his ears and his eyes and just like, it's, it's a very, very um, abstract way of looking at it, but the idea is when you go to hell, you no longer can keep your emotions inside of you. They move to outside of you in physical form. So if you're feeling sad, you can't just put on like a facade, like I'm happy. No, literally, it's just like the goo just oozes out of you when you're sad. You know, when you're feeling rage, it's the same thing. It's probably a different effect for each emotion, but you literally wear your emotions, your mind outside of your body on a sleeve. And I guess it's supposed to be some sort of torture, but Sile seems to be strangely enjoying it, although he he was already kind of a creepy sort of guy, so, and I don't really, uh, yeah, well, let's just, let's just move on here, but yeah, Silaporo is back, and, uh, creepy as ever, pretty much, right? So he emerges from hell, he immediately sees Ichika behind Renji, and is like, oh, is that your daughter, Abarai Renji? Let me kill her! And so Renji obviously grabs Ichika, like, okay, we're getting the hell out of here, do not talk to that guy, and just like, get out of here, and Sile summons these hell, these hell chains from hell! Hell chains from hell! And they chase after Renji, and they like, impale him, like they stab right through his body. Ichigo shows up, slices the chains, and is like, get Ichika out of here, Renji! I got this weirdo! And Sile Aparo knows who Ichigo is, like, you know, from, you know, during Hoikomundo, obviously he would know about his existence, like, you are Kurosaki Ichigo! And Ichigo's like, who the hell are you? I don't know. I don't care. You're really freaky. I'm going to fight you. Okay? So they begin their fight there, too. And now, we cut over to the, uh, Soul Society in front of Ukitake's grave. Remember when Shunsui was, like, you know, having a drink next to Ukitake's grave, uh, you know, when the Soul Society was rebuilt, you know, at the end of the Bleach series, right? So they're there, and as they're all gathered, waiting for the vice captains to come back with a hollow for the captains to kill in front of Ukitake's grave. This is a normal thing. All of a sudden, this black goo begins to just emerge around the grave. And they're like, what the hell is this stuff? And it's like, well, it's not reishi, because it's not, like, you can't detect it, and it's not fading back into the environment, because everything in the Soul Society is made out of reishi. Like, this isn't reishi. What is this? And then somebody's about to touch it, but then Shunsui moves behind, and he slices it with his sword, and it's kind of like sizzling on his katana, and he's like, this is, um, Jigoku no Rinki, uh, or Phosphorus from Hell. Another translation was a Will-O-Wisp from Hell, but Will-O-Wisps are, like, a little different. Like, that's a spirit. This is more of, like, a substance, like a, a Phosphorus, you know, like, kind of like, a, um, uh, what's it called? Ectoplasm. It's kind of like Ectoplasm from Hell. It's like this black goo that's coming out of everywhere. And so, Shunsui's like, that's strange. And everyone's just like, what does that mean? And Shunsui's like, hmm... I have a theory. I don't know if it's true, but I have a theory. And they're like, go on. It's like, okay. So Shunsui explains this, and this is kind of the woe moment from the chapter. This is something that brings it beyond just like a celebration of 20 years of Bleach or whatever, and like, you know, oh, this is just a fun little chapter. No, this information sets up like a new story arc, basically, from what you could do with this premise, okay? So Shunsui, takes this ectoplasm from hell and he's talking about do you know about spirit grade or spirit class or ray 
Every so once in a while in Bleach, when they reference a unit of measurement, they use it as re or re. I can't remember the pronunciation. But it's basically like, you know, in 12 spirit miles or 12 rays or re's from here, you know, something like that. Basically, that spirit grade, that spirit class, refers to the density of souls in that specific area, okay? This is like a grading system, okay? It's sort of like a power level, but it's not really. It's just like a grading system of spiritual density, okay? How dense spiritual matter is. And he says, for reference, a, uh, a regular Shinigami, like a regular soldier in the Gote, not a seated officer, a regular Shinigami is spirit grade 20. 20 of density. And then as you get stronger and you have a higher rank, the number goes down. So by the time you become a vice captain, you're probably grade like six or five or something like that. And captains are even higher. But he mentions that if you are grade three or higher, which is the captain class, you're so spiritually dense. You've received so much power at that point that you actually cannot go back into the soul society. Now this was explained with uh, Rukia and Kai and Shiba's backstory. When a Shinigami dies, their soul, their matter, well, the, okay, the soul and the matter are different, okay? In the world of the living, you have physical matter, like what we're made out of, okay? And then you have a soul inside of that. When you die in the world of the living, your body, you know, just decays like anything, and then your soul migrates to the soul society or hell or wherever you end up going, okay? Uh, let's just use the soul society just to keep it simple. So your soul goes to the afterlife. However, you do get a new body in the soul society. It's just made out of reishi, but it's still housing your soul, okay? So when you die in the soul society, the reishi body you have disintegrates into the ground that makes up the soul society, and then your soul reincarnates again into another realm on the cycle of samsara, of Buddhism, because that's what Kubo's going with here. It's all about balance. However, when you get really, 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 really strong, like Yamamoto, Unohana, Uketake, Ichigo, Aizen, when you get really Kenpachi, when you get really, really strong, your spiritual matter is so dense, it actually cannot join back with the Soul Society. So what do you do? Well, this is where this Konso Reisai came in, where it's a ritual where if you slay a hollow in front of their grave, 12 years specifically, I don't know why it's 12 years, 12 years after the death of the Shinigami in battle, and I don't know if it specifically has to be in battle, I don't know, like, well, I have another theory about that, so hold on for a second. But if you do that, then that allows the Shinigami to return to the ground. However, Shunsui says that might not actually be what happens. I have another theory, it's kind of like a rumor, some gossip, but it's stated that if you have spiritual grade of three or higher, three, two, or one, you can never return to the Shinigami realm, or you can never return to the Soul Society. And so what happens instead is that this ritual, the Konso Reisai, it doesn't return them, it sends them to hell. That's the theory, anyway. Um, and it's confirmed by Sila Poro Grants, and it is also confirmed about what happens next. So this happens, okay? So just to reiterate, Yamamoto, Unohana, and Uketake died in battle during the fight with the Quincy's 12 years ago. They died there, but their souls and their bodies were still kind of existing in the Soul Society. But it can't exist that way forever because that could cause detrimental problems if these really strong souls are just floating around the Soul Society forever. But they can't reincarnate because they're too strong. So they're doing this ritual to uh, hopefully put their souls to rest. But it doesn't do that. It just moves their souls from the Soul Society to the bowels of hell. And then so Silaparo begins to state, ah, you don't understand what you just did, did you? The balance has been off offset. The balance has been offset. So what happened was because Aizen is in prison and Yuha is defeated, both were really strong enemies on this side of the realm of the, of the Soul Society. And then Yamamoto and Unohana and Uketake just got, well, at least Yamamoto and, and uh, Unohana and Uketake's ritual was just performed. All of that got shifted to hell. The balance Creek is now way more on Hell's side because there's nothing on this side to balance it out. Yeah, you got strong Shinigami like Byakuya and Ichigo and Kenpachi and Uohara, but the balance in Hell is, you know, you got freaking Yamamoto, Unohana, and you got Uketake now. That tipped the scale. And Aizen's locked away in prison. So he can't, he doesn't really count, uh, I guess. So anyway, yeah. So now because all the weight on Hell's side is there, they're able to force the doors open from Hell's end 
end of the end of the realm, opening the gates, and then boom, literal hell on earth. And with that being said, Jushiro Uketake Zanpakuto, uh, Sogyo no Kotowari, a giant-sized version of Sogyo no Kotowari, emerges from the hell gate, stabs Siloparo. Don't worry about it. He seems to enjoy it. Like, oh yes, well, you're early Jushiro Uketake. They have all been sent to hell. And Ichigo's like, wait a second, gates of hell? That doesn't make any sense. You know, we didn't even do anything. And so Siloparo's like, oh, what do you mean? The ritual, you just completed it. You slaughtered all of those beasts from hell. By the way, the names of those things from hell were called Jigoku no Gaki, or uh, Hell Prita Path Hollows. So Prita is there. Prita, or the Prita Path, is the hungry ghost realm in Buddhism. It's Hueco Mundo. So that would mean these are the hollows that got sent to hell. So like Shrieker. Shrieker was a hollow, but then he got purified by the Zanpakuto, but he didn't go to the Soul Society, he went to hell. So basically, think of them as just, you know, basically just steroided up hollows that got sent to hell. They're a little stronger and they don't have reishi, but they're not ridiculously powerful because the vice captains were able to slaughter them here. But that's not the issue. They were still hollows. You killed them in front of Jushiro Uketake's eyes. And then we see a close-up of Ichigo Shihak show where we see his combat pass is still inside there. And remember, Jushiro was the one that gave that to Ichigo. There might have been a connection between Jushiro and the combat pass. And we learned during the full bringer arc, the combat pass can be used to sense and like detect and basically spy on Ichigo. So it basically can be like you killed the hollows in front of an object that Uketake owned, or you killed it in front of an object that was connected to Uketake, whatever. that requ the, the necessary requirements for the Konso Reisai have been realized, and now Uketake has been revived. Well, sort of. The sword comes out and stabs Siloporo, and he's like, I'm going back to hell now. Well, you guys have fun. By the way, a little little food for thought. Hell has always been next to you. Don't you think it was a little odd, those little butterflies that were flying around that always guided the Shinigami and were next to them wherever they go through the Dongai? Aren't you a little bit concerned or worried that they were called Hell Butterflies? Jigoku Cho? Why was Jigoku in their name, Ichigo? You ever think of that? Well, I'll give you some time to ponder it. Siloparo signing out. He gets stabbed and run through and dragged back down into the gates of hell. Pfft, they shut. And then you see a close-up of one of the skulls. Remember, the gates of hell have those giant freaking skulls on them. The skull begins to form flesh and an eyeball. And then we cut away from that scene. And then we have the last scene of the chapter, which is Kazui Kurosaki. Piece of paper fell down. We have Kazui Kurosaki running away as we see the hell butterfly flying away in the distance and the new title, not no breaths from hell, new breaths from hell, new breaths from hell. Is Rangiku gonna go to hell now? Maybe Haribel? Haribel's still around. Maybe Haribel can show up and fight some demons. That'd be cool. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. That was a long one. <laughs> oh, a new story unfolds. We have Kazui there, and on the Viz translation, it says, like, the end ellipses. So I think there's going to be more to this than this just chapter. I don't know if it's going to be, like, a 10-chapter series or a new arc or whatever, and I don't know when we're going to get it, but it can't just end there. It can't just stop there. That was establishing. So Yamamoto, Unohana, and Uketake are all in hell now because of the balance of everything and those have to be the enemies that we have to fight? Holy shit! Sign me up, right? Aw, oh, man, you better not be trolling us on this one, Kubo. Mm. Oh, hey, it's the Trollometer! Remember the Trollometer? Aw, oh, man, those were good days. But no, Trollometer aside, this is insane, right? Because we didn't really get to see, a lot of people complained, like, we didn't get to see what Unohana's Bankai was capable of, or what could Uketake really do? We never saw his Bankai, and Yamamoto, we saw his Bankai, but it was only, like, one chapter, two, three chapters, we saw that. We didn't see the full breadth of what he could do, so, yeah, the full breasts of what he could do, I mean, come on! So, this is perfect, too, because last arc was all 
all about the Quincy's and the history of the Quincy's. And if this is a new arc, the, the true final arc of Bleach that maybe Kubo intended this whole time, now instead of dealing with the Quincy's or the Hollows, we deal with the Shinigami. We deal with the past and the story and the lore of Shinigami and what happens when they die. If every single captain that's ever died in battle went to hell, you can bet your bottom dollar that every single one of the Kenpachis are down there. Where did, oh, right here. Every single one of the Kenpachis are down there, not just Unohana, because that's how you become a new Kenpachi. It's like fight the previous Kenpachi. We could literally see a scene where Kenpachi Zaraki is going up against every other Kenpachi that came before him, which are like 10, because he's the 11th. So, holy crap, right? Right? Um, so there's that. Unohana would be there. Uketake, we get to see what all that's about. And obviously going to hell warps your personality and changes the way you are. And so Yamamoto and Unohana and Uketake, they would not be the same people that we're familiar with. There's a car outside. Give it a second. But anyway, uh, what about the Espada? What about the Stern Ritter? I don't know if Yuha would go down there because Yuha was kind of something different. Um, you know, and actually, I think in the Can't Figure Your Own World novel, Yuha kind of becomes the new Soul King, if I'm correct. Um, that, that's like implied that he does become the new Soul King. So Yuha wouldn't be down there. But the Stern Ritters that died might be. Like some of the Stern Ritters, well, okay, Basby's, Basby died. Yeah, Basby died. Hashwolf killed Basby. So Basby might be down there. Holy shit. All these different Shinigami that died in Espada. Oh, God. This, the opportunities of this. I'll be making a separate video because I'm really, it's, yeah, uh, this was a long video. I'm not going to stay here any longer than I, than to this to explain, but you know, I'll do another video. It'll be okay. More, more bleach content. It's coming down the pipeline, but this was an insanely good chapter. Uh, if you haven't read it, go read it. If you've already read it, read it again. Uh, this will be teching. This will be Barry signing out. Anybody else want to say goodbye? No? Okay, good. I'm going to go lie down for a little while. Oh God. Oh yeah, I hope you're ready to party, cause it's vampire teching! I got fireball whiskey, we are set to go. Are you feeling okay, man? You look kinda, ooh, an Oreo. Hmm. Dark chocolate, the color of the night.